thanks Miles for the introduction and uh, uh, thanks for, to uh, Monica and um, Antonella for the for organizing the series of seminar. It's a great uh, uh, thing to be here. So uh, the talk uh, is uh, about uh, a series of papers that uh, I will uh, list at the end of the talk that I wrote together with uh, Antonello Scardicchio from the uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste and uh, uh, together with Darren King, uh, uh, who is a graduate student at UT Austin and Salvatore Stubard, who is a postdoc uh, uh, student at uh, UT Austin. And so, um, uh, so let me get started. Uh, the, uh, the starting point uh, of this uh, series of papers is uh, um, trying to understand the limitations of the uh, minimal surfaces problem as a model for uh, soap films hanging from a wireframe at mechanical equilibrium. So uh, the model essentially, um, everybody should be familiar more or less with uh, what I'm talking about here, is, um, is the following. So you have a, a, the wireframe, uh, it's modeled by um, a closed carbiner 3, W. Uh, the soap film uh, itself is modeled by a surface, uh, denoted here by S, and the sentence that the soap film is hanging from a wireframe uh, becomes the mathematical condition of prescribing the boundary uh, points of your surface to be uh, the, se the set of points in the curve W. So the notion of uh, mechanical equilibrium uh, instead uh, is translated in the minimal surfaces model with the condition that the mean curvature of the surface is zero. So the average bending uh, uh, is, uh, is balanced and it's uh, known. So this is, for example, a catenoid that uh, uh, I constructed uh, in this uh, same office from which I'm talking. So, uh, and the origin of this condition, the zero mean curvature, uh, comes from um, a physical argument uh, where one balances uh, the pressures uh, that are exerted along the soap film. So there are two pressures, uh, pressures at play here, two forces. Uh, one is the atmospheric pressure, um, so it's just essentially the molecules of air bouncing on the soap film. And the other one is the surface tension. So surface tension is a form of pressure. It's essentially the lateral pull of the surface creates a normal force acting on the surface. And, uh, and this is what comes from, with, this is what uh, is described by the mean curvature operator. So it's a classical argument going back to Laplace and Young in 1805 uh, circa, and then there is, of course, the question of uh, understanding how their argument, their balance of pressures, can be uh, can be formulated in a um, variational setting. So can can be explained this condition in terms of energy minimization, and uh, and this is the work of Gauss, 1830, some 25 years later, uh, with the principle of visual works. So the idea of Gauss is that one should consider the area uh, of the surface S under the formations that are small deformations of the identity. So there is the identity, and then there is a little normal deformation defined by a function nu that is zero on the wireframe. So you, we are essentially, we are just locally bumping uh, uh, or pushing our surface. And uh, if you do the derivative at time t equals zero of this uh, deformation, you find the integral of the, of the mean curvature times the function new that you use to describe the bump. So if you want that uh, this derivative is zero for every possible deformation, you require that the mean curvature is zero. So in a sense, uh, Gauss argument brings back the uh, Laplace and Young argument into the framework of uh, energy minimization or better say the critical points uh, for some energy function. And the reason why I am, I am recalling these things, these classical facts is that they will play an important role in what follows. Uh, so it's not just to create context. Um, so let me speak about the limitations of the model. So uh, um, our papers come from a very specific limitation of the model that is not usually uh, the first one people think about. So let me first review two important limitations of the model uh, that have been discussed uh, uh, for decades by the mathematical community. So the model is zero mean curvature prescribed boundary. And of course, the first limitation is a, a model for 
describing physical situation is the high level of non-uniqueness of this problem. So uh, in a very, for example, one takes a very simple situation, W is given by two coaxial circles. Uh, so the circle will have radius R and will be at distance H in parallel planes. And uh, if H over R is sufficiently small, less than 1.33 circa, there are three different minimal surfaces such that the boundary of, uh, well, this should have been an S, is equal to W. So the first one is a pair of disks. So somehow the two um, disks don't see each other, let's say. The second one is given by uh, a sort of a fat catenoid that it's almost a cylinder. And the third one is a skinny catenoid. It's a catenoid that looks very much like the two circles joined by a very narrow tube. So whenever the two disks are in this ratio, uh, sorry, whenever uh, the distance of the disks and the radius of the disks are in this relation, you find all of them. Now, the third one, you will never see anything looking like the third one in general uh, because it's unstable. So um, it, whenever you go near to something like that, essentially you pop back to the two disks. But both these solutions are stable and as this little graph show, uh, they exchange the role of area minimizer. So when H over R is sufficiently small, the fat catenoid is the global area minimizer. Then there is a transition here when H over R is uh, approximately 1.05 where they have the same area, and then the fat catenoid is still a local minimizer, but is not the global minimizer anymore. The area is, is the uh, minimizer, and uh, um, I don't know what this is. And uh, uh, the, um, instead, the, the unstable catenoid you see is always above both in energy. And uh, so there is a high, high, high level of new uniqueness, and uh, Actually, a second limitation of the model is that uh, um, when, you, when you say uh, zero mean curvature, you are uh, meaning that the, your surfaces are smooth. But actually, uh, this a priori smoothness that you're assuming has no place in reality. So this is an example. This is a minimal surface I uh, took a picture of uh, yesterday. So it's a kind of an approximation of uh, two uh, parallel circles. Um, and as you can see, minimal surfaces can very happily uh, define singular surfaces. Here, there is a mid uh, disk of soap hanging in between uh, the two circular wireframes, and it's joined by catenoidal necks. And here, there is a singularity, a line of singular points. So even assuming the a priori smoothness, in a sense, is a limitation of the classical model of minimal surfaces, in the sense that uh, this guy will be a local minimizer. It's very easy to observe it. Still, is not in the classical film. So, uh, but the limitation that actually uh, started uh, all these themes will come back in the in the talk. But the limitation that actually started this uh, uh, investigation was is the lack of length scale. So when you try to solve this equation, mean curvature of m is zero, boundary of m is prescribed, and you rescale the boundary data by an arbitrary factor, say arbitrary large, uh, you still find by rescaling the solution of the problem. So there is uh, uh, absolutely no limitation on the size of the soap themes that you're trying to describe. So there is no length scale in the model. And uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, something that uh, gives you in principle, paradoxically, uh, results like, uh, uh, for example, a circular wireframe should generate, according to this model, a soap film, uh, no matter how large a wireframe is. This is, of course, unrealistic and false. Uh, uh, there, there is actually a physical threshold, uh, depending on the properties of your soap film and on the intensity of the, uh, for example, the gravitational field in which you're doing your soap films, uh, that uh, at a certain point, will make your even a circular disk uh, will become essentially unstable for thermodynamical reasons. But to understand that, you have to describe soap films as three dimensional objects. You have to understand their thickness and you have to uh, leave the simplified realm of surfaces. So, and indeed, this is the key point. Soap films are actually 3D objects uh, with a thickness that uh, can be measured and is in the order of. Uh, 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 micrometers. And so, first of all, I would like to do what Laplace and Young did. So it's derived the correct equation for a soap film seen as a three-dimensional object. Um, of course, uh, rather than using a surface, I will try to use a, a surface with thickness. 
Uh, the argument is uh, actually, as you can imagine, is, is not uh, uh, new, is not even complicated. For example, uh, I was able to trace it back on a book by the Frey the the and Prigogine on surface tension from 1966. It's also sketched in a book by uh, uh, the Genes uh, and others. Um, more recent. So, I mean, you can find it in the physics literature, but somehow, what is the argument? So, uh, the argument is the following. You have, so, we try to think about our soap film as a three-dimensional uh, object, and we make the kinematic assumption that uh, uh, the film has a mid-surface S um, and as a thickness, alpha of X, that change with the position. So, actually, this mid-surface is an ideal object, uh, and the, the two real interfaces somehow of the soap film will be the surfaces S plus and S minus that are obtained by taking the normal deformation of the mid surface S uh, through this thickness parameter alpha. So the thickness of the film will be twice alpha, actually, if I use this notation. Um, and then one goes on writing the pressure uh, exerted, uh, the pressure felt by the three dimensional soap film at the point X plus and then the point X minus. So I describe uh, in terms of the mid surface, I find points X plus and X minus on the two interfaces. So X plus will be X plus alpha, the normal, and X minus will be X minus alpha, the normal at the point. And uh, the pressure at the point will be given by uh, the atmospheric pressure P0 uh, and uh, um, the mean curvature uh, of uh, S plus or, or of S minus multiplied by the surface tension. Remember that the mean curvature is one over length. So to make it a pressure, I have to multiply by something of the order of Newtons over meters. And this is the role of this surface tension constant. And if you do the, uh, the algebra here, you will find that the pressure at the point X plus is P0 minus sigma, the mean curvature of S plus, uh, the mean curvature with respect to the normal pointing outwards, the film, while uh, the mean curvature at X minus will be uh, obtained exactly by reversing the sign. So this is the mean curvature of S minus with respect to the outer unit normal to the film. And then of, there is, of course, the fact that if you are in a, um, if you want to include gravity, right, uh, the, uh, there is a force acting on the, on the bulk of the film, that is gravity, and therefore uh, the, uh, there will be a difference in pressure uh, from the point X plus and the point X minus, and this difference will be um, given by the density of the liquid, the uh, Earth's gravity if you are on Earth, and then there is the difference of the positions of the two points uh, with respect to the vertical coordinate. So you got this rho g x plus minus x minus the scalar e3. And uh, if we just plug in the formulas for x plus and x minus that are given here in the picture, we got a two alpha normal to the surface. So we got two alpha normal to the surface scalar e3. Now, uh, this is, these are the equations. So you, you don't get anything simpler than that. Okay, so this is not nice because it was better when we just had to study h s equals zero. But uh, uh, something you can do uh, starting from this equation is, is a little algebraic manipulation that now I'm going to do, and that gives you uh, an equation for the mean curvature of the mid surface. So uh, it's easy because you see uh, the uh, twice Rg alpha nu s scalar e3 is equal to the difference of the pressure. So you, if you take the difference, you cancel the atmospheric pressure, and you just got this uh, the surface tension constant, and then you have h of s minus minus h of s plus. And now both these quantities can be easily described in terms of the curvature of the mid surface, at least uh, under the assumptions that the gradient of alpha is small. So if the gradient of alpha is small, uh, these uh, mean curvature is essentially given by the sum of the, cur of the principal curvatures of S divided by one minus alpha Ki plus the sum of the principal curvatures divided by one plus alpha Ki. Now, here it's not important that one follows exactly all the details, but uh, it's, it's just interesting to see what's the outcome. So you see here, uh, I just do a Taylor expansion in alpha uh, and both terms will give me a sum of kappa i's. So the both terms will give me uh, twice the mean curvature of the mid surface. Then the, the first order in alpha will cancel out because here we get minus alpha sum of ki square 
uh, sorry, plus alpha by a square, but here I will get minus alpha sum of k a square. So the first order will cancel. And then there is an non-trivial order that goes like alpha square and uh, it's uh, cubic in the principal curvature. So if I plug everything back together, so if I look at these into that, I got an equation for the mid surface. So the mean curvature of the mid surface will be proportional to the thickness uh, times the constant that depends on the, um, on the rho g over sigma square root. It is a famous constant in the physics literature. It's called the capillarity length of your uh, uh, soap solution. And plus an order of alpha squared. In particular, if the principal curvatures are different from zero, these terms will be, this term here will be non-trivial even in the absence of gravity. So in a sense, this equation tells you that even in the absence of gravity, uh, if you treat minimal surfaces as three-dimensional objects, and their mid-surface has zero principal curvatures, then you should expect the mean curvature of the mid-surface to, um, to be small in terms of uh, the thicknesses itself, okay? Um, so, uh, now, you look, at, you look back at what I've just said, right? So, I've done some 1805 kind of uh, uh, physical consideration and to model uh, minimal surfaces as three-dimensional films, uh, objects, even with these simplifying kinematic assumptions, I end up with something, something that looks much more complicated than the minimal surface equation. So uh, not to speak about the boundary conditions that I have not prescribed, right? I am not prescribing boundary of S equal to W. So, these equations are not, what I'm trying to say is that these equations are, are not look very useful in this form. So one will, will understand better uh, how to derive them um, from energy minimization. Uh, why? Because to clarify the boundary conditions, to understand when they hold. Indeed, let me stare at three points. So the first one is that all these equations are, um, are derived under the kinematic assumption that there is a well-defined uh, thickness of the film. But, uh, thickness is not really a fundamental physical quantity. The volume of the liquid that forms the liquid soap film is the physical quantity that matters. The thickness itself is more like a parameter that you would like to understand uh, describing the geometry of minimizers or critical points of your energy. The second point is that, uh, as I said before, minimal surface, actual soap films have singularities. So the whole concept of mid- uh, uh, surf of, of having a smooth mid-surface is not very well posed uh, as soon as I see something like the singular catenoid I have described uh, a few slides ago with the picture. And the third point is that uh, it's hard to visualize what is the uh, energy minimized here, right? So, um, so uh, and that's actually the easy question. So what is the energy minimized? Uh, uh, there is no doubt what is the energy minimized is the capillarity energy. Uh, so the mechanical equilibrium of the 3D region of liquid is uh, described uh, by the phenomenological model uh, of capillarity theory. So it's essentially you minimize the perimeter of your region of liquid under a volume constraint. So let me quickly uh, set forth my terminology for capillarity theory. Uh, so what is capillarity theory in this mathematical uh, setting I'm describing. So we have a container, omega, and a region occupied by the liquid, E, that is a subset of the container, omega. And the volume of this region is fixed, the, the amount of liquid is fixed, and it's typically small uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the, the other physical parameters you are introducing in the, in the model. And the capillarity energy is given by this long formula, but essentially what it's in here. So there is the area, of, uh, oh, uh, here I put a boundary in the wrong place. Sorry, there is an error here. So this should be uh, the area of uh, the boundary of E inside of omega. So the first term should be the area of this part uh, of uh, the boundary of the liquid region. Uh, then there is, with a coefficient between minus one and one, the area of the so-called wetted region, that is the part uh, of the domain that sits uh, on the walls of the container, plus, if you want, a potential energy like gravity. Uh, so, uh, in the case of a soap film, 
what is the container, right? That's the first question because it's the container is the complement of the wireframe. That's the that's the region of space where the soap film is contained. So it's a very peculiar container. It's an unbounded container. So if you imagine your wireframe that you were modeling as a curve gamma before, now you're taking a delta neighborhood of this uh, curve. It's a three-dimensional object. I mean, if the soap film is a three-dimensional object, so more the wireframe that is definitely much larger than soap film. So the soap film will become a three-dimensional region W and the container for capillarity will be uh, the complement of this object. Uh, okay, this is nice in principle, but uh, it just doesn't work because if you try to minimize uh, the capillarity energy, so you try to find an object with small volume con inside this container, uh, say without gravity, otherwise there is no global minimizer, but uh, uh, so you will find that your uh, global minimizer without gravity will just be a tiny droplet of liquid sitting at the point of high curvature in the boundary of omega, or which is the same, the boundary of W. So there is no reason in the capillarity model to see uh, a, a, a region of liquid that is stretching out, that is spanning the wireframe, okay? That's it. So uh, it seems that uh, you're lost. So this result is proved in a series of paper that are uh, recalled here. Um, so we need, we need to add essentially a spanning condition. Uh, what is the spanning condition that we're going to, to add? So this is a good point to introduce the um, Harrison pugh formulation of plateau problem. So here we have a compact set that will be uh, our solid wireframe, and we fix a family of embeddings of S1 into the complement of the wireframe. So uh, we have a lot of embeddings of S1, so little circles that are embedded in the complement, and they are... Uh, uh, and this family of embeddings, it's closed by homotopies. So if I, have, if I have one of the circles, I have all its homotopic images in omega, in the complement of the wireframe. Okay, and then Harrison and Pugh say that a closed set in omega is a spanning W if it intersects all the curves from the family C. So you see, yeah, I have a compact set that is intersecting uh, W, that is a spanning W in the sense that it's intersecting all the little curves gamma in the family C, okay? Um, so this is what is called in these papers a homotopic spanning condition. And the existence of minimizers for this problem has been proved by Harrison and Pugh in 2013. And uh, um, I mean, the, the setting has been uh, uh, kind of a, somehow extended and made more flexible with different proofs in the paper of Delellis, Giraldine, and myself appearing in 2014. So, uh, what is interesting about this model, one of the interesting features is that uh, uh, these closed set that are minimizers, so closed set can be extremely bad, right? So we are minimizing its Hausdorff, n-dimensional Hausdorff measure, n-dimensional area, right? Uh, could be extremely wild, but one can prove that these, these uh, compact sets minimize uh, the n-dimensional area with respect to Lipschitz deformations that are uh, different from the identity in a compactly contained subset of omega, in particular by classical results of uh, Almgren and Taylor, uh, minimizers will satisfy plateau laws, so will be smooth surfaces with zero mean curvature away from singular sets that will be extremely tame. So in the plane, so n equal one, you will only have singular points of this form, three half lines at 120 degrees. In the physical space, so where we have two-dimensional objects, you will have three half planes meeting at 120 degrees along uh, lines and then smooth deformations of them. And, uh, or you will have tetrahedral kind singularities. So these are the only possible singularities that were conjectured by uh, the experimental work of Plateau, uh, very well known experimental work. And then uh, Taylor and Algren proved that indeed they are the only possible singularities if you have a compact set that minimizes the Hausdorff measure. And the Harrison Pugh theory gives you exactly that, gives you compact sets that minimizes the Hausdorff measure and span a wire uh, in this very peculiar sense. So examples, for example, if W is two points and C is the loop around one of the points, uh, in order to span S, so you have to intersect not only gamma one, but all the homotopic images of gamma one. So here you could take ga gamma one and stretch it and span all the space in between. So you need, the minimizer will be just a line. 
So very quickly, what are other examples? If you have three points, you will find immediately a singularity. So the minimizer with three points is, uh, rather than being, say, two segments that join the three points, is uh, uh, three, half seg three segments meeting at 120 degrees at some midpoint. Okay, this is better, shorter length. Uh, if you have four points, now it's funny, why four points? So if you have four points, you see that it all depends on the class C. So for example, here I'm choosing this uh, particular size of, of C just gives me as the minimizer these two very short segments. But if I choose, if I add a third curve, gamma three to my collection of C, and then I have to intersect all the homotopic images of gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three, then I cannot just go for the two segments that uh, connect these two points, but I have somehow to dwell in the mid space because of gamma three, and this will be a minimizer typically. Uh, and indeed, this is what happens physically when you see the singular catenoid. So when, when, when you dip in the water your frame and you pull it out, uh, there are a lot of strange things that happen that we don't really know how to describe, I think, uh, deterministically, let's say, but there are things happening and the topological uh, uh, phenomena happening and somehow these uh, tell you at the end of the day in this horizon cube formulation what is the class C you would like to minimize area with respect to. So this is what happens, this could be what happens in this point from this point of view when I dip and I see then a singular catenoid. Uh, of course there is no uniqueness, if I play it right and I put these points at the right distances the same C will have two minimizers, one that have singularities and one that is smooth. So even in the horizon cube model, there is a high level of no uniqueness at play. Okay, so now I'm ready to tell you what is the model that uh, together with Antonello Scardicchio and Salvatore Stuvard, uh, we proposed for understanding this uh, problem. So as much as in Arizona and Pugue, we start from a compact set in Rn plus one, that will be our solid wireframe. We prescribe a spanning class of cars that loop around this W. And then, uh, okay, this is the problem of Arizona and Pugue, I've called the infimum L. So it's the infimum of the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure of closed sets that span all the, that intersects all the curves gamma in my homotopy class. And then I do capillarity with, okay, I put the surface tension at one, there is no trouble with that. I neglect the terms coming from uh, the interaction with the wireframe because uh, they're interesting, but they're not my first concern. I don't take gravity for the same reason. It's very important, but it's not the first concern here. There's a lot to be done without gravity. And then I impose the motopic expanding condition. So this psi of epsilon is the capillarity problem. So is the capillarity energy is the boundary inside the container, area of the boundary inside the container for subsets of the container that have fixed volume. But I am, if I stop here, I find the little droplet sitting on the wireframe, but now I add the spanning condition. Add, adding the spanning condition so that the boundary of E inside of omega intersects all the loops, forces my droplet to stretch out to fill all the space inside of the wire. So here it's a sort of 3D picture and here it's a sort of midsection picture coming from the 3D picture. So this would be the wire frame and this would be my solid region. And in order to intersect this gamma and all its homotopic images, right? Uh, my droplet has to stretch. So at least we're imposing what we wanted to see. So we wanted to see a droplet that stretches and fill the space. Um, what is the mathematical difficulty in addressing that? There is an obvious mathematical difficulty that if you look at a minimizing sequence for this problem, it will be a sequence of sets that try to minimize the perimeter. So it's just the area of these two interfaces, right? while they achieve the spanning condition. But what could they like, what could they try to do? Uh, what uh, uh, could, uh, could they try to do in order to minimize the energy? You see, along the, the minimizing sequence could become uh, thinner and thinner in some regions of space, and then it would be completely collapsing. So I could still find that my sets converge to a limit set with the right volume, but somehow the boundaries of my sets collapse, and then the boundary of the limit set is smaller in a sense than the limit of the boundaries. So there is a loss of energy if this happens in the sense that the boundary of the limit set E cannot account for this area that was counted for in the minimizing sequence 
and was needed for spanning because of course I can imagine that down here there is one of these loops that I have to intersect with. So the boundary of B alone, sorry, the boundary of E alone will not be able to intersect a loop that passes through this region. And so I will need to use this collapsed region both to achieve the spanning and to account for the total area that the minimizing sequence was uh, paying for, okay? So the technical difficulty in doing something like that is that uh, how do you even describe the limits of minimizing sequence? So if you were wondering why this very basic uh, uh, approach to um, capillarity and to soap films uh, uh, as not being pursued uh, at another time could be a technical difficulty because describing this requires a lot of modern uh, mathematical technology. Essentially, you need all the arsenal of geometric measure theory to make sense of this. So, let me give you the first theorem. Uh, uh, this uh, theorem containing the first paper with uh, uh, Stuvard and King, and it's uh, the existence of what we call generalized minimizers. So uh, assume that the horizon pube model has finite energy, that the boundary of the wireframe is smooth, that the complement of a wireframe defines a connected region of space, which is essentially hard to believe that you have a wireframe that doesn't do that. And assume that there exists a minimizer in the horizon pube model such that even if you fatten it up a bit and take a small neighborhood of it, it is not able to contain all the loop, uh, it is not able to contain any loop in the family. Again, it's very hard to imagine. Uh, we don't have an example of something that doesn't do that, and we have no idea how it goes. So these are somehow technical assumptions that tells you that this, this setting that you're cooking up is not uh, extremely pathological, okay? Um, then, under these mild assumptions, every minimizing sequence will possess a generalized limit that is given by, will be given by a compact set K. Uh, so this compact set will contain the boundary of the limit set and the collapse regions. So there will be a limit set in, in omega, a limit li region for the liquid of the right volume E, and the boundary of this region will be contained in the compact set K that will be in principle larger than the boundary of the limit set. So the set K will do the spending for you, okay? It, will con it may contain collapse regions uh, that will help you in achieve the spending conditions, while the set E will be the limit of the minimizing sequence. So when you look at the area of the boundaries of the minimizing sequence, this area will converge in the sense of random measures to twice the area of the collapse region, so the part of kappa that is not in the boundary of E, plus with multiplicity one, the area of the boundary of E. And the optimal energy will be indeed given by twice the area of the collapse region, kappa minus boundary of E, plus once the part of the boundary of E. And you will speak about a standard minimizer if the boundary of E and kappa are the same object, and you will speak about a collapse minimizer if the kappa, the, this limit set will be larger than the boundary of E. Um, so it's very important to, to understand this theorem. The, the crucial thing is seeing examples. So uh, let me start with an example in the plane where I have two disks and uh, uh, there is no collapsing. So I have two disks. The minimizer in Horizon and Pug is a segment uh, of length L, that is the distance between the two disks. And uh, the minimizer E in my problem will be given by two very flat circular arcs. So their mean curvature will be epsilon. Actually, their curvature since they're one dimensional objects. They will be, it will be over their epsilon. So the optimal energy will be twice L because I'm paying twice the distance here plus a constant times epsilon square, uh, plus a little of epsilon square. So if this is the energy of Arizona and Pug, and this is the volume parameter, uh, the energy in my problem will grow like 2L plus C epsilon square. It will be above that. Now, here you don't have collapsing. So what is this collapsing about? To see collapsing, you see it immediately. You just have to go uh, to the case of W given by three disks. So the minimizer of the Horizon Pug model would be uh, these uh, three half, three segments meeting at 120 degrees. And this will be the minimizer in our problem psi of epsilon. So a minimizing sequence, a small volume, will prefer to collapse somewhere, you see? So the limit set will be that, will be, will be this curvilinear triangle 
near the singularity. This will be where all the volume, all the area in this case, will be concentrated by the minimizing sequence. Meaning that the boundary of V will not be able to span, right? Because it will not uh, intersect uh, these, uh, uh, these circles, but the minimizing sequence, the boundaries of the minimizing sequence were spanning. So what, where did that information went? Well, it went in the presence of this compact set, this collapse region that, uh, that I've drawn here in purple and that I am going to pay with weight to, with multiplicity two when I compute the total energy. So the optimal energy in this case will be twice the area of this guy plus once the area of this boundary. So um, if I, here I've drawn again the picture, so S will be three segments and my generalized minimizer will have a collapsed part uh, that we pay twice the length for, and we'll have a boundary of E that consists of three circular arcs of negative curvature. Actually, the curvature will be huge as the area goes to zero, and it will go like minus one over square root of epsilon. So here you see what is the profile of the optimal value function. It will go like twice L, that is the value in the plateau problem. And then it goes like minus constant square root of epsilon. So it dives down with negative, infinitely negative derivative before it starts growing up again. So this is the behavior. So you see, this is the two possible, simplest possible situations, two disks and three disks. The energy behavior, it's completely different. So it's completely different. And uh, so the behavior of the curvature of the minimizer, the, the minimizer here will have small curvature as suggested in my pressure equations. So my pressure equations were, were, were telling me H of S order alpha square, right? Where alpha is the thickness. So you see, this is exactly what my pressure equations, my classical derivation of pressure equations was telling me. But then the minimization problems, it's telling me that as far as the volume is concerned, the volume will be much more concentrating near the singularity. I will have collapse region and so thickness in particular at uh, in this first approximation of reality where you reintroduce volume in the problem, thickness could be zero on part of the surface. So to see a thickness you would need everywhere, you will need e e an even more refined model. If I will have time, I will talk about that. But let's first worry about the sharp interface model that is a handful already. So um, the second theorem we prove with King and Stuvard, e, and Stuvard is, the, uh, is the following convergence to the plateau problem. So take the problem Psi Epsilon, the function Psi Epsilon is lower, lower semi-continuous. It satisfies a sort of isoperimetric bound that holds for every Epsilon and that I draw here, you see here in the plane, it's square root of epsilon as for large values of epsilon because our existence theorem doesn't require epsilon to be small. Although that's what we are interested about. And if we send epsilon to zero, we converge to twice the value of the plateau problem. Uh, so in fact, what we prove is that if kj, ej is a sequence of generalized minimizers for volumes that goes to zero, then there exists a minimizer in the horizon cube model such that in the sense of rather measures, twice uh, the collapse part plus Hausdorff measure of uh, uh, the boundaries converges to twice the Hausdorff measure uh, restricted to the minimizer in the horizon cube model. And that's a delicate result obtained because if you think about my examples, right, one moment ago, I don't have, uh, I cannot use compactness bounds from geometric measure theory. I don't have, a the structure of currents or of sets of finite perimeter for these collapse objects. I don't have the, I don't have trivial bounds on the mean curvature, so I cannot even take limits in the sense of variables. So it's a very delicate argument, but, uh, um, and it leads to a correct, to a conjecture. So our conjecture based on our example and on our understanding of these proofs is that when the horizon puke model doesn't have singularity, so all the minimizers are regular, then, the, there should be no collapsing. So the minimizers in our problem should, should, kappa should be the boundary of EJ. And the convergence should be smooth and with small mean curvature. We have, a, we have some partial results in this direction we are working on, but that's open. And then uh, there is also something that uh, lies between the, the, a conjecture and uh, something you can check on examples. And is that, Actually, the problem Psi Epsilon has, acts as a selection principle for the limiting plateau problem in the sense that if you have a non-uniqueness in the limiting plateau problem, our model will choose 
Okay, we'll choose. If there are singularities, those with more singular set, because they allow you to save more energy in the approximation. And if there are no singularities, you have no uniqueness of smooth minimizers, our model will try to go for the ones with more curvature, more second fundamental form. Why? Because it allows it to save energy again. So this is just to tell you that in this approximation, you start also gaining a selection principle for global minimizers when you have no uniqueness in the protocol. Uh, then there is the issue of, uh, uh, let me check the time, okay. The issue of the regularity that is very delicate. So in these papers, we proved that uh, um, if you consider this energy, so the energy of a generalized minimizer will be twice the collapsed part plus once the perimeter of the limit set. Okay, a generalized minimizer is actually a minimizer of this energy uh, among different morphisms that fix volume. Okay, so that's the diffeomorphism of the complement of the wireframe into the complement of the wireframe that fix the volume of the uh, bulky region of the generalized minimizer. And we can use that to show the following, to show that essentially the collapse part is a minimal surface. The boundary of the non-collapse part is a constant mean curvature surface. Of course, in saying that, a constant mean curvature surface where the constant could be positive or negative, as my example shows. Um, but there will be singular sets. So it's not that they're just going to be smooth, okay? So there will be singular sets. Uh, there will be a closed subset of the limit set K, okay? And uh, this will have uh, null area. So the zero mean curvature part will be a smooth and the zero mean curvature out of a set of zero area, that is not a very good information, it's pretty bad actually. And even worse, the transition region between, between the CMC and the constant mean curvature and the zero mean curvature part will happen on this uh, uh, crimson set uh, that all we know about it is that it has empty interior. So in my example of the three disks, that guy is three points. In general, as far as this general theorem goes, we only know it has empty interior, that's very bad. So uh, we expect much stronger regularity, and that's something we're working uh, uh, night and day on. And what uh, we have been able to prove, uh, I think, so far, is that uh, it's something about the collapse region. So in dimension one and two, so in the plane and in the three-dimensional ambient space, so in the case that we might care most because these are the physical cases, okay? Uh, we actually think that our argument shows, our arguments show that the collapse part is smooth. So there, there are no singular points in the collapse part, okay? It will be just a classical minimal surface. So if this is correct, the, and uh, we can uh, finalize our arguments, the final result, uh, well, the next result, uh, the next version of this theorem will be that here you're smooth and zero mean curvature. Here you're smooth and zero mean curvature, and then there is a transition region that we have to take care about. But of course, I mean, before going to the transition region, we want to understand as much as we can the two regions that go there and attach together to create the transition region, right? So, and then I have a, a, a final slide where um, uh, I can tell you something about the geometric properties of minimizers. Uh, so under the same assumptions of the existence theorem, if the collapse part is non-trivial outside of the limit liquid region, then the Lagrange multiplier is negative. So if you collapse uh, the liquid droplet, as negative mean curvature. And if you have negative mean curvature, you have the convex hull property. So when you have the negative, mean, when, the, when the liquid part has, uh, uh, when the bulky part has negative mean curvature, then uh, the whole thing, even the collapsed part, is containing the convex hull of the wireframe, which is a classical property of minimal surfaces. So it's nice to have it still in this model when the mean curvature is negative. We expect it to have it also when the mean curvature is positive, uh, because when the mean curvature is positive, we expect to converge smoothly to the solution of the plateau problem of Arizona and Pugh, and that satisfies the convex hull property. So we expect this to be general. But when lambda was negative, it was, in a sense, uh, harder to... Uh, when, so when there was collapsing, it was harder to get there. So that's the interest of this result. And uh, uh, just uh, to conclude, I, I am really almost done. Um, so just to give you an idea, the proof of this fact that if you have collapsing, the lambda is negative, uses deformations that are non-mapping. And that's the interesting part of this 
that's what makes so interesting this model for us, uh, mathematically speaking, because uh, you cannot do everything just with Lipschitz deformations or smooth diffeomorphism. You need to use a bit more creativity. For example, the proof of this theorem part one essentially goes like that. Take the collapse part where it has multiplicity two and then divide it into two parts of multiplicity one, kind of open it up and create a competitor. And then you have to fix the volume by pushing inwards the part where you have a bulk in the generalized minimizer. And then essentially, since this was a minimal surface, at least in a generalized sense, the area increase will be quadratic in the volume you're adding, while to restore the total volume, you do an area variation that is linear in the volume because you have your mean curvature lambda. So the only way this is not decreasing the energy is if lambda is negative, okay? So that's why, why you have this property. And it's interesting that you cannot achieve that. So you see this object here is not, this black surface is not the image to a map of this red surface because it's a sort of multivalued image of that, right? So without the need of using multivalued maps, but it's clear that you, can not, you cannot discuss this problem just by using uh, uh, standard calculus operations. You have to invent new things. So uh, these are the, this is the bibliography, the first paper with Skardik and Stuvard uh, appeared on discrete continuous dynamical systems in 19 and was written for uh, uh, Luis uh, Caffarelli's 70th birthday, uh, birthday uh, where we introduced the model and we study minimal sequences of surfaces with mean curvatures going to zero. Then there is the paper with King and Stuvard when we did this uh, um, existence and uh, basic regularity theorems and convergence to proto problem. And then there is a more recent preprint where we discuss these collapsing and convex hull properties. Um, and, uh, and that's for the talk.